Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week on The Final Straw, we're featuring a conversation with anarchist author and activist Peter Gelderlos about his latest book, The Solutions Are Already Here, Strategies for Ecological Revolution from Below, published by Pluto Press in 2022. For the hour, we speak about critiques of science and Western civilization at Peter levels, as well as the centrality of struggling on the ground where we stand, creating autonomous infrastructure, resisting colonial extractivism, and the need for imagination and care as we tear down this ecocidal system. If you're listening to the radio edition, check out the podcast for a little more chat. Peter has also authored in the past such books as Anarchy Works, How Nonviolence Protects the State, and Worshipping Power. You can find a number of his essays up on Anarchist Library. Also, you can find links to our past interviews with Peter in the show notes, alongside of some of our past interviews that we've conducted with people resisting various capitalist mega projects around the world, including some that show up in Peter's book. Now, a couple of brief announcements. Anarchist and anti-fascist prisoner Eric King has been transferred from Grady County Jail, where we had spoke to him for the April 3rd episode, to USP Lee in southwestern Virginia, where his loved ones are afraid that he'll be put into solitary confinement and attacked, where there will be no witnesses. This comes directly after he won a trial against the Federal Bureau of Prisons, showing that he had been set up and punished for false reasons, subjected to obvious acts of petty and not-so-petty vengeance by the corrections officers, and in spite of the fact that his security level should have him at a medium security facility rather than high security one like Lee. There is continued call-in campaign that his supporters are asking y'all to participate in. You can find more information in the show notes or at supporteriking.org, as well as on the Twitter and Instagram pages for the support campaign under the name at support Eric King. Mayday is coming up really quick, y'all. The 1st of May has been known as the Festival of Spring Bounty from Pagan Times in Europe uh, and has been celebrated by anarchist socialists, communists, and labor activists to commemorate the 1886 struggle and strikes for the power of workers against the capitalists and the state, and also to remember the Haymarket Martyrs. We have a couple of episodes featuring content about May Day that we'll link in the show notes, but this is just a quick note to suggest if you want to to find other comrades and fellow travelers this May Day. There may be something going on in your area, and if there isn't, maybe you can organize an event with your friends. So I'm very happy to be speaking with anarchist author Peter Gelderlos. Uh, Peter's latest book, The Solutions Are Already Here, Strategies for Ecological Revolution from Below, is just out from Pluto Press. I just got my copy in the mail. Uh, super stoked to get it. But welcome back to the show, Peter. Uh, thanks for inviting me again. Facing the challenges of increasing climate chaos and its impact on life on Earth feels really, really fucking daunting without thinking through the idea of like some centralized, grand and technocratic response. This is kind of how I feel like I've been trained to think about big problems as big solutions. And not that that seems likely when countries at the industrial core aren't even able to hold themselves to you know, self-imposed limits of cutting back on producing greenhouse gases or even coordinating and distributing free vaccines to stop a pandemic. Um, So I'm sure I'm not the only one that head is kind of spinning when I try to think about the looming and existent climate disaster. Like, how does this book kind of help to challenge that framework and mindset of expecting big centralized solutions to the problems that we face? Well, when you look at the history of how states have been dealing with uh, with the ecological crisis, first of all, they're very reductionist. They reduce a complex, multifaceted ecological crisis, which, which ties into so many problems, social and environmental. They tend to reduce it to emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, only to climate change. And they do that in large part, not only because they don't want to recognize many of these other problems, but also because because like, technocrats need to simplify problems in order to uh, reduce it to data that can be plugged into their machine, right? So even though they're they're reducing it just to, to climate, and they've been they've been aware of the danger of of climate change, like the U.S. government recognized it as as a national security problem already back in the 1960s. 
their responses have been militarizing borders and increasing the the deployment of of militaries for um, you know so called disasters natural disasters and things of that nature and then also making big agreements that have done exactly nothing to slow down greenhouse gas emissions so even within their reductionism they don't do a good job of dealing with the one part of the problem and the other part of the problem that they recognize is actually bad for us increasing militaries militarizing borders and and all that so they they are viewing the problem with interests that are diametrically opposed to the interests of living beings like ourselves the the larger part of it they they have to ignore and then of the part that they look at half of it they don't get right and the other half they deal with in a way that that actively harms us we've also seen in a lot of these so-called natural disasters that the most effective responses for saving lives are responses that happen on the ground it's not the militaries it's neighbors it's regular people organizing themselves spontaneously with a logic of mutual aid that's what saves the most lives we've seen that time and time and time again and absolutely we we are totally conditioned to rely on on the government to solve things for us or you know major corporations you know techno wizards like Elon Musk or whatever and and that's in large part because we're we're forced into a situation of dependency and passivity and immobilization which is a very depressing position to be in normally and it's an even more depressing position to be in when we see the world dying around us and and so it's completely coherent and consistent with that forced dependency and forced immobility to just either look or look the other way or cross our fingers and hope and pray that you know some big godlike figure will come along and solve it for us but it's this big godlike figure that that's that caused the problem and that is continuing to aggravate the problem so actually you get more intelligent solutions to problems from people who have on the ground knowledge from people who who uh, are familiar with their territory uh, know the the resources they have and it's it's equally global it's just coming it's coming from the territory it's coming from below rather than coming from uh, either you know boardrooms or situation rooms where they're not looking at the territory they're looking at maps and they're above all looking at their own interests of of maintaining control because their their ability to do anything in response to the problem is in fact predicated on our immobility on our dependence and our uh, enforced passivity so there's almost like a sort of stockholm syndrome that a lot of us through through the socialization from the state have where we identify the the methods and the impulses of government in scary situations as being somehow salvatory as opposed to uh, sort of counterinsurgency constantly being operated for the continued like extraction of resources. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought up counterinsurgency because that is one of the most important theoretical lenses to use to understand both the ecological crisis and government, corporate and NGO responses uh, to that crisis. A thing that I found refreshing about this book is the radical critique of Western civilization as the vehicle for uh, many of the woes that we experience today. I appreciate that you attempted to undercut the misconception right off the bat that human nature is the cause for the destruction that we're experiencing around us, or that there are too many of us or too many of certain kinds of us on the planet. Can you talk about the ideas of the Anthropocene or arguments around overpopulation and why they present kind of a misdirection when seeking causes of anthropogenic climate change and resolutions of finding balance with the world? Yeah. Human beings have been around for for a really long time, uh, depending on you know when exactly you identify like the beginning of, of anatomically modern human beings, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, hominids with you know similar capabilities for for longer, and the problems of destroying the ecological basis for for life on on this planet for a great many species is is a recent problem. And even the problem of causing ecological collapse in, in just one bioregion is in the broader timeline, you know, a recent problem, you know, with maybe like 4,000 4, years old, some of the earliest examples. And again, some people, because we're, we're taught to view uh, human history 
uh, in this way that, that ends up being very white supremacist, but focusing on the history of states. Some people take that to mean, oh, well, for the last 4,000 years, you know, human beings have been destroying the environment. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what's relevant. No, for the last 4,000 years, humans have not been destroying the environment. A very small number of human beings have been, have been doing that in a very small part of our overall territory until much more recently. And all across the world, people fought against getting forcibly included in this, this new Western model of being human. We do, we do have examples of non-Western cultures also destroying their soil or destroying their forests, destroying their, their ecosystem. But, you know, they weren't nearly as good at it as Western civilization is. And, and that's, the, that's the dominant model. So that's the most relevant one to talk about. So, you know, the, that other question is relevant for the theoretical exercise of like, okay, what, you know, what exactly are the more destructive or the healthier forms of social organization? But in, you know, I mean, in the current media environment, most people will bring up this kind of, you know, somewhat trivial fact at this point that, you know, maybe 2000 years ago or 1000 years ago on another continent, a completely non-Western society, you know, also caused major erosion. Uh, and that's, that's just, it's just an instance of, of deflection away from the fact that the, the problem that's currently killing us is Western civilization. So, you know, there, there are works that, you know, like, for example, um, you know, Freddie Perlman's Against Leviathan that, that try to, to define, you know, what the problem is more broadly. But in the situation where we're in right now, where species are going extinct at an accelerating rate, where millions of, of humans are already dying every year because of the effects of this ecological crisis, and, and so many people are, you know, losing their homes, losing their land, losing their access to, to healthy food. The, you know, the problem is the civilization, uh, the modern state, uh, the capitalist system that arose centered in Europe, but also simultaneous to this process of mass enslavement in Africa and, and mass invasion, colonization and, and genocide in the Americas, in Africa and in, in Asia and Australia. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. Like if, if you take any criteria beyond just greenhouse gas emissions, it's, it becomes very clear, you know, what's the social model that, that is putting us all at danger. And even if you reduce it just to greenhouse gas emissions, you kind of avoid looking at like the historical roots of the, of the social machine that's, that's causing so much death and destruction. But it's still very clear that Western civilization and the economic model that it forcibly imposed around the rest of the globe is the problem. So one thing in the book you also say is that it's necessary for us to critique science because it's so shaped by those institutions who wield it, fund it, and command it. Can you talk about this and how it how it differs from anti-rational rejections of science uh, for the sake of faith structures or anti-modernist frames of some anti-civ perspectives? And maybe speak about how you've observed our movements or movements that you find inspiring in this framework, how they've been making and imagining their own science. Yeah. I mean, first off, maybe this is more semantical, but like, like I, I do think a, like a critique of rationalism as a worldview is, is important. But then again, different people would mean very different things with that. So, so just to focus on your question, in practice, in the real world, the scientific method cannot be divorced from the scientific institutions that currently control or manage the vast majority of knowledge production via the scientific method in this in this world uh, that we inhabit it's you know i love science fiction we can imagine other worlds but that that's you know that's the case in the one that we inhabit one thing that i think is important to recognize is that the scientific method is a very valid method for knowledge production for uh falsifiable objective data i think it's also important to recognize that that's not the only kind of knowledge uh, that there are many other kinds of knowledge that cannot be produced by the scientific method and that we run into, first of all, there's no, there's been no social system in the history of the world that I'm aware of that has ever relied only on that kind of knowledge. Uh, and the, the, our current rationalist society, ra like talk, speaking about rationalism as a, a sort of mythical worldview, uses a great deal of, of like non-falsifiable and, and subjective information, but they pretend that they don't. Uh, as as part of this mythology, which is very very important to, to to certain you know people, academics and and whatnot, 
so so it's important to recognize i think that that's not the only form of knowledge and like so a brief example of this like you know we can even see this when you know like we get you know beyond like the importance of for example emotional knowledge how to how to deal with people uh, with other people in groups how to take care of people uh you know (laughs) this is something that's actually incredibly important and it's amazing how uh how easily it, you know, can be dropped by the wayside because it's not reduced to uh, to numbers. But for example, let's look, we can look at healthcare. So there are forms of healthcare that are much easier to evaluate using the scientific method, and there are forms of healthcare that are much harder to evaluate using the scientific method. Finding out what happens when you, you know, dump some drug in a human body is much easier to evaluate because the person who's administering the drug doesn't need to know anything about it. uh, And they don't need to know anything or barely anything about the person that they're administering it to. And that's sort of like the point of that whole methodology of treatment. Whereas other forms of treatment require a much more subjective approach, a much more modeled approach to the specifics of the person who's being treated. And they, they require a much more developed skill set to be able to deliver the therapy in, in an effective way. So that's not the fault of the therapy that it can't be evaluated as well by the scientific method. That's, that's a limitation or a fault of the scientific method. But we live in a society uh, that's so mechani- mechanized and, and that loves to be able to have, it's in fact built up on knowledge forms that can be, you know, plugged into the machine and, and you know, spit out the numbers. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's a society very much based on mechanical reproduction. Uh, that kind of society is going to favor the treatments that can be evaluated by the scientific method, and it's going to disfavor or uh, discourage or hide the treatments that can't. And a year does not go by without us finding out about how, you know, how damaging some form of medication was or, or how damaging this blindness towards certain, certain forms of therapy and care uh, were. And that doesn't, that doesn't invalue, uh, invalidate scientific knowledge production, but it does certainly speak to the question of social machinery, that it goes beyond just the question of like, can we test this? Is it, you know, is it valid or not? It's that, that in fact, in practice, we can't separate it from the question of social machinery. What does that have to do with the ecological crisis? I already mentioned the reductionism of a multifaceted, very broad, very complex ecological crisis to climate change. That's symptomatic of what I'm talking about. Climate change is something that's more easy to quantify. We can measure it in temperature. We can measure it in parts per million carbon dioxide. We can measure it in emissions. Whereas things like what I know about the place where I live, what I know about the health of the soil uh, in the place where I've lived for the past uh, seven or eight years is not something that I can quantify, but I know it, I think, much better than, than someone who might come by and take a sample from a laboratory and, and test it, but does not have any further relationship with not, someone who's not out there you know, taking care of these olive trees or planting a garden year after year and wondering when the rain is going to come and feeling it in their bones, uh, how this territory is desiccating and how we actually need to start doing things now and fast as this climate becomes more of a desert because there are dead deserts and there are living deserts. And this land right here where I live is going to become one or the other, depending on what we do. And the people in the laboratories are, are, they're way behind the game and they have a lot less to offer. They do have things to offer. Like, you know, there, there are certainly moments in which my gardening and other people's gardening can be complemented by having access to that chemical test from the laboratory. And, you know, that would be great to have that kind of complementarity, to have, have, you know, even solidarity at that level. But you usually don't have that because our systems of knowledge are gaslit. We are excluded from the resources that we would need to be able to access that. And, and the people in the laboratories generally have no idea what they're talking about and, and think that they have access to some absolute and all-encompassing truth. And that's, that's problematic. So yeah, there is uh, there's absolutely a possibility. Uh, I mean, there should be you know, a great deal of, of relation dialogue between different kinds of knowledge, including knowledge that's produced through the scientific method, but we don't have a lot of that now. And when you, we look at how history is actually unfolding, the data produced by powerful scientific institutions regarding climate change 
has not been wrong per se. The broad strokes of it have been correct. Like for a while now, they've been predicting what's going to be happening and it's been happening, but it's been quite conservative. Time and time again, they have been way too optimistic in their predictions and the the kind of, um, you know, red lines or warning marks or benchmarks or whatever that they set are, are getting exceeded. They're getting past years and decades in advance of their predictions. So in terms of the precision of their predictions, oh, sorry, the, you know, they have high precision predictions, like, you know, like me, like, you know, looking at the soil and the rain clouds or, you know, like someone who's actually lived there their whole life and has access to like a lot more ancestral knowledge that I don't have access to. They're not going to be able to come up with like a high precise prediction of like, okay, in 20 years, this is going to happen. But I think they will get a much more accurate prediction. Whereas, you know, the, the scientific institutions have had high precision and low, low accuracy. So they've actually been wrong in a dangerous way again and again and again. And I don't think it's a coincidence, given their proximity to and affinity with the institutions that are most directly responsible for the destruction of, of you know, the current uh, global ecosystem. So, yeah, I guess that's a good clarification is like systems of knowledge rather than sciences. And as you say, that that seems like a like the need from the Western civilization or the organizations that are working within it to, to have crunchable numbers and quantities that they can put into their figures seems like it would also like not only would it limit the output information, but it probably blinds the people that are making the measurements, even if they're trying to make the right measurements to, yeah, to see the actual outcomes. The approach of looking systemically and, and uh, uh, trying to say that in fact, all of these systems and how they correlate to each other can fall under one umbrella that we call civilization and it's colonial impulse or Western civilization. It's colonial impulse. I, when people see a critique that is that large, oftentimes people will say, ah, but there are things that we have gotten from this system. They will say that. They will say that capitalism has driven innovation and and the creation of certain kinds of knowledge or certain kinds of technology that have benefited human life in a lot of ways. For instance, one, one thing that they can point to is around um, medical science. And as you said, there are some treatments that have proven to be not so much treatments as poisons uh it's not it's not a like an assured thing that medical science will resolve issues but there are a lot of technologies that have been developed and applied over the centuries that are positive and i could see someone saying well do i choose between the current structure and like small reforms within it or supporting a sort of like revolutionary alteration in the productive models, the distribution of resources and capacity to produce these technologies that are saving my life or making it so that I can be mobile or extending life uh, for folks that have like very serious medical issues, for instance. There has been critique, for instance, of like criticisms of modern civilization that came out of Earth First at its beginnings. Um, or other eco like pro ecological movements that look at not human beings as a problem necessarily, but um, technological development as being and the sciences and the knowledges that come out of that. Not to say that they are just produced from that, but you know that are applied there. Saying like if if the government fails, for instance, or if the economy scales back, I'm not going to be able to get my medication and I may die. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of um, reticence that someone would have of trying to approach uh, a degrowth of the economy and the government because they're afraid that what safety nets exist for them currently would no longer be there and they wouldn't survive it. Yeah, that's that's a definitely a very legitimate way to to address questions of social change, and I think it's actually super important when when we inhabit our own bodies, our own experiences and needs when we look at, when we look at, when we're, you know, talking about proposals of, of widespread social transformation and, and struggle generally. I think it helps to primarily like to, to consider two different things. One is that if we break out of, you know, an, an individualist framework, which the um, like I said, the, the, that that concern that you're posing is very important. There's also an iteration of that concern, which is very, very dangerous, because if we make a critique 
of Western civilization on the basis of how many people it's killing, how many millions of people are, are starving to death because of this model, uh, all of the, um, the forests and ecosystems that are getting destroyed, it can be dangerous. Like we, you definitely don't want to go into uh, like a framework of like, you know, it's, it's us or them. Like, you know, someone has to die, you know, in, in this situation. So first off, I think we need to break out of any kind of like indiv- individualist or competitive comp- uh, conception of this problem. And if we look more systemically, or if we look at health as a collective good, the healthiest possibilities for human society are ones in which people have a healthy reciprocal relationship with their environment. Uh, They have access to the commons. They have access to a, a very diverse and healthy diet that is locally adapted. And that is in fact, based on brilliant technologies that were thousands of years in the making uh, that that existed in every territory before colonialism, which is a technology without, you know, whirring gadgets and and lights and bells and whistles, but it's the technology of how we build up our survival mutually with the other organisms around us, with the other living beings around us. And many of those technologies still exist. And so without colonialism, with access to that commons, with access to that kind of rooted territorial, popular and ecological technology, that is the best hope that a human community has for health, for the healthiest lives possible for all their members. So that's one thing that I think is really necessary to acknowledge, that we live in a system that produces disease, that produces death, and that's that's a huge problem that we can't sweep under the carpet. The other good thing is that when we destroy governments and capitalism, everything that that they own, everything that they think is theirs, everything that they blackmail us with because they control access to it and and we have to spend our lives working to try to get a small piece of it, it'll be ours. And so once all the rich people are gone and once all the cops and all the politicians are gone, all of that will be ours. And we can decide to get rid of it. We can decide to keep it. We can decide to make it ourselves uh, in, you know, under much better circumstances. So things like medicine will obviously keep making and we'll find ways to make it that are healthier. We'll find productive processes that are less damaging for the environment. And we'll also be changing our living conditions. So as few people as possible need access to, to those technologies, but those who do need that access will get it. And then we're also forced to deal with other, other technologies like nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs. And, you know, the, the state has saddled us sadly with the necessity to, um, to mediate those in the best way possible because they're not going away uh, for, you know, forever. That those, you know, some of those radioactive substances will be around for billions of years. So thank you, government. But we will do a better job of handling that than they do because we care about us and because we're actually good at organization when we get the chance. In the U.S., every single nuclear waste storage facility has leaked at one time or another. So they're, they're crap at it, and they're also to blame for it. On, on my worst days, I definitely fantasize about, you know, <laughs> locking them all in the, uh, in the nuclear storage uh, facilities. There would be a certain poetic justice to that. But thinking about it more realistically in, in the question of, of our needs, all of it will belong to us for for better and for worse and and we'll we'll figure out how to take care of us and we'll do a much better even i mean even though lately like in uh, in our movements it's pretty depressing because we are we're i think learning a bit too much from the, the society we live in and we're doing frankly often a pretty terrible job of, of taking care of us but we can do much better than the state or capitalism ever could yeah and they've had the opportunity to prove that already and there's tons of people that you know in as far as distribution of treatment methods for things or COVID vaccines or whatever, like they have proven that it is not in their interest. It is actually in their interest to deny large swaths of the population any number of these things so that they can mark up the price and make more money off of less. Yeah. 
So some of the most inspiring parts of the book for me were the examples of resistance to mega projects, to the expansion of colonial extractivism, as well as to some of the alternative movement experiments and infrastructures that you highlight and that you get voices from, which is great. Were there any that you wanted to include, but you just didn't have time to fit that you might share with the audience? Um, there, there are definitely some, there are some cases where I was looking for interviews and wasn't able to get in touch with, with the comrades who would be able to, to speak, you know, from personal experience about those struggles, or I was able to get in touch, but they were in the end too busy to do, to do interviews because, you know, th- things are, things are pretty difficult. And so I, I, I can name some of those maybe for people to, um, to look at them more but um i won't i won't go into them precisely because you know i wasn't able to 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 learn enough about them so for example in the movement in in kurdistan there's there you know an ecological focus is is a large part of the analysis and it's a territory that's been very damaged by war by uh desertification by forced impoverishment uh, coming from the the various countries, the various states that control uh, Kurdistan, and so I, I know. Uh, in fact, yeah, some friends like helped put out uh, put out a book about some of the some of the the experiences in in you know trying to help make that desert bloom. But uh, yeah, the, the comrades, you know, it's been of course a rough time over there, so the comrades weren't able to to give an interview about that. So that, that uh, didn't make it into the book. Let's see there. Uh, there are many, many very interesting struggles in, in India. I mentioned some of them on the basis of already published research, but I wasn't able to, um, to, yeah, to arrange any interviews with, with comrades there. Uh, India is interesting because there are very, very different experiences of reforestation that demonstrate Again, just how we can't really trust the media, how we can't trust governments when they talk about this, because reforestation means completely different things, you know, depending on on who's saying it. And a lot of forms of reforestation are very, very bad for the environment. And they're basically things that, you know, say like a government like Chile will do to be able to count, get counted as like a negative carbon emission country. So then they can make money uh, with carbon trading when like in Chile, the, the reforestation is very much an industrial activity which is which is bad for the environment very bad for the soil bad for the water table and it's very much a colonial activity because it's taking place on the lands of indigenous peoples who are in the process of trying to recover their lands and a huge part of that process is trying to win back their food autonomy so forests are important forests can also be edible forests the the these pine plantations these monocrop pine and eucalyptus plantations that are being planted by the official institutions are definitely not food forests. They, you know, no one can feed themselves off of them, but also fields, agricultural fields are important for a lot of, a lot of peoples to feed themselves. And the, the official reforestation happening in, in Chile is often used as a weapon against indigenous struggles, against the struggle, for example, of, of the Mapuche for food autonomy, for getting their land back and being able to feed themselves off of their land using traditional technologies and whatever, you know, modern or Western technologies that they feel like adapting. That's, that's you know, up to them. And to the extent that they can do that, to the extent that they have food autonomy, they have a vastly increased ability to fight back against the colonizing state because they're no longer dependent on global capitalism and they're no longer dependent on the state that that colonizes them. And so in India, there's some really great examples that really contrast how ineffective and also how damaging uh, state-led efforts for, for mass reforestation are, how they just respond to this technocratic impulse to, you know, produce numbers on paper uh, when on the ground it's a completely different story versus communities many of them indigenous communities that have been undergoing very very effective large-scale forms of reforestation that uh, improve soil health that increase the possibilities for food autonomy uh, that increase quality of living and that you know help create more robust ecosystems with habitat for for other species and in addition to just humans so um that's that's uh yeah i you know i would have i'd, I'd love to one day really meet meet comrades who are um who are participating in that because that's those some really powerful struggles happening there 
Well, you do put the invite in the book for uh, a longer extended like sequel if, if folks had more stuff to inspired along these lines. So if any listeners are out there and want to write that book, I would love to read it. Over the years, we conducted a couple of interviews with Ann Peterman from a, a group called No GE Trees, who was talking about that struggle in Wamapu. And like one of the, because they were, and similarly, like trying to build solidarity with resistance to that sort of monocrop forestation that damages the soil, that depletes the water tables, that um, denudes the landscape of, of the vitality and the variation that's required for native species to exist in it throughout actually the U.S. South. And so people were protesting in the Asheville area in solidarity with not only resisting GE tree plantations in the Southeast, but also in Chile. And a lot of the, um, a lot of those trees like they're not good for a lot of things, not good for making lumber out of, especially eucalyptus growing up on the West coast. Like that's the, they're not good for windbreaks. They got planted for windbreaks. They're not good for railroad ties. That's what they got planted for at one point, but, but they get chopped up after a couple of years of, of growing. So not even creating a mature forest and processed down into wood pellets and then sent to Europe so that European governments can claim that they're using a renewable source of energy production. It's just this game of shells with um, carbon and other, with basically pollution and degradation. They, they, it's a continuation of the extractivism of neocolonialism. Absolutely. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network, calling in another bomb threat to remind you that every single countdown ends at zero. Channel Zero Network. Take back the future in five, four, three, two, one. This is the final straw, and you're hearing our conversation with Peter Gelderlos about his recent book, The Solutions Are Already Here Strategies for Ecological Revolution from Below. We've already seen like a measurable connection between climate change, the disruption of food production, um, exacerbating conflicts, and uh, you know, being used as a weapon against indigenous communities, as, you know, as you've noted, and resulting in increased refugee movements and displacement. As a result, right-wing tendencies have welcomed an escalation of conflict and inequality, the building and buttressing of physical and metaphorical walls, and the acceleration of fossil fuel extraction to suck out every drop of profit that can be withdrawn before it's too late. And to be fair, I say right-wing. This also goes for centrist neoliberal regimes as well, but the rhetoric looks more actively genocidal oftentimes and is, and and facilitates extra uh, parliamentary violence when it comes from the far right, usually. Would you talk a bit about about the importance of the increasingly in some ways difficult project of fostering internationalism and intercommunalism against this like nationalist tendency as as the uh, climate heats up yeah obviously you know the the far right and and you know neoliberal centrists more so have a lot of advantages because they have access to resources they you know they get a lot more attention they're they're uh, taken seriously. So even a lot of centrist media uh, that pay attention to the far right in a disapproving way uh, still help them out more than than what than the way that they treat uh, like truly radical transformative revolutionary movements uh, by just ignoring them uh, because we're kept in this in this permanent place of either not existing or being infantilized, and we have. As as you pointed out, we have a lot of we have a lot of work to do on this front, and we can also talk about forms of internationalism that that are very damaging. Uh, this is the kind of internationalism which is completely under the thumb of you know colonial or neo colonial institutions. It's this you know worldwide recruitment that takes place uh, largely through universities of you know try it's sort you know sometimes in, in in a limited fashion it's been analyzed as a brain drain, but I think it it goes beyond that of basically training and recruiting people from all over the world to participate in this system, whether it's under the auspices of the United Nations or under the auspices of, uh, you know, some prestigious university in the global North to create an internationalism, which is a completely uh, monistic, technocratic, simplified worldview that 
builds consensus about you know what the world looks like, what the problems look like, and what the solutions are within elite institutions that are completely cut off from you know all of the various territories of the world, even as those institutions increase their their recruitment to a global scale, so that they have you know they have representatives or spokespeople from you know from all the different continents from all over the world, but they're they're brought together in a um, in a sort of epistemological technocratic space, which is, you know, completely a reproduction of, of, of colonialism and makes flexible, but, um, but furthers the dominance of, of, you know, Western civilization of, of white supremacist civilization. And so that's, that's a kind of internationalism, which is very, very present and it has access to a great deal of resources. And on the other hand, in the global north, we're not doing uh, a nearly good enough job uh, to create a very, very different and subversive kind of internationalism. And the comrades who are doing the best job of that tends to be uh, migrant comrades, comrades who have who have migrated, who have crossed borders. I think a lot of folks who grow up, you know, with the privilege of citizenship in the global north, uh, if if they do travel, if they do you know, try to get like a more global perspective, it's often still done in this individualist way that has a lot more to do with, with tourist vacations than with the needs of a revolutionary struggle. And so we, we don't have, I mean, we don't really have communities in the global North because the triumph of, of capitalism is, is so complete, but we don't have radical groups that are attempting to be communities that pool resources in order to intentionally create global relationships of solidarity with communities and with struggles in the global south, you know, that they could actually be supporting and that they could actually be creating dialogue with to to develop the, the you know, rich, detailed global perspectives that, uh, that we actually need, as well as the possibility for global solidarity. So, yeah, in, in the book towards the end, I do this exercise of imagining like, you know, what if we're actually able to do what I'm talking about or what I'm trying to argue in the book is like a, a real model for like a revolutionary transformative response to the ecological crisis. And so since I'm talking about the need to root ourselves in our territory, I imagine, OK, here we are in Catalonia. What does this look like over the next few decades? And one of the first things is, you know, well, in, in Barcelona and in Tarragona, we have these big ports with, you know, these big old ships that are, you know, currently moving merchandise all around the world. And that's something that on the one hand, you know, it needs to stop because, you know, how much that's based on on fossil fuels and on, you know, unnecessary consumption and all the rest. And it's like the, the later timeline in that chapter of the book is, you know, maybe much more beautiful and romantic, you know, imagining like, you know, people, there's no more borders and, you know, people can traverse the world in, in sailboats, which are, you know, like sailboats that have been expropriated from, from the wealthy, who of course no longer exist. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that's a beautiful thing to imagine. It, it's, you know, it's really nice to think about like, you know, a world that we're actually allowed to live in and that, you know, people all over the world can travel and go where they want. But right now, you know, we have the ugliness to deal with. And so in those ports, there are fuel reserves. They've, you know, already been, you know, dredged up from the earth and there are these, you know, big, uh, ocean going, uh, cargo ships. So there's a part that talks about expropriating those cargo ships, getting in touch with revolutionary comrades in the global South that, that we already have a relationship with and finding out what they need. There's the example of early on in the, in the pandemic, both in Catalonia and in other territories, uh, workers taking the initiative to repurpose their factories to make parts for respirators. Uh, in a way that was faster and more agile than the capitalists were able to do. So kind of taking a cue from that, I imagine this process of, okay, instead of sending merchandise, which is just furthering a relationship of dependency, well, speaking with this one comrade from Venezuela, other comrades from from Brazil, like a major thing is like their their economies and their material environments have been intentionally structured in a way so they don't have a lot of very basic things that they need that in Europe or in North America would be easier to find. So for example, like basic machine parts for the machines that would be needed to process food, like not even, you know, not talking about like, you know, some like hyper industrial and and unnecessary endeavor, but basic things like, you know, harvesting, threshing and milling grains, for example. 
So instead of, you know, a, a relationship of dependence where, um, you know, this really fertile territory like, like Venezuela gets grain imports of like, you know, European grains that are indigenous and, and, and Afro-Indigenous populations, you know, have, have you know, not been um, traditionally consuming and that are certainly less healthy. So basically supermarket food, instead of importing supermarket food, this short-term process of expropriating those cargo ships, repurposing uh, fab- uh, fab- uh, factories, English, sorry, from like the automotive industry to make some of these simple machine parts and then using the existing fuel reserves to send off these cargo expropriated cargo ships uh, so that in these other territories that, you know, that are, you know, colonized, neocolonized territories uh, that we have a relationship of solidarity with, they can create their own material autonomy and, and break that dependence once and for all. And then we're also not, you know, just navel gazing and thinking like, you know, how are we going to survive the climate apocalypse and making sure that our bunkers are well stocked, but we're actually thinking about collective survival in a way that is solidaristic, in a way that is realistic, in a way that is global, and in a way that recognizes our responsibilities given the past and present of, of colonialism and white supremacy. Yeah, and I would say that the one group that I'm familiar with that really has continued doing a good job on the subject of like building or or continuing like solidarity across the borders is like Zapatista structures in the US. There are still despite the fact that, you know, the revolution, the Zapatista revolution happened and there are still active six declaration Otra Campania groups or whatever that are around all sort of parts of um, non-Spanish, like 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 Anglo-dominated North America and Turtle Island. Like it's just, it's astounding, and I, I wish that. But people did it really well during that period of time, and I think that that's something that's something that's been lost is is these clear lines of communication and and like the building of inspiration, the sharing of of knowledge, of experience you know, across that border to the south of the country that are the, the nation state that I live within the borders of. There's so many, there's so many overlaps in like labor struggles that happen. There's so much uh, cross-border transit of, of goods. And I have so much more in common with people across that border than I do who f- fucking run those corporations here. Yeah. Um, another point that I really liked in the book, and you've, you approach this in a number of different ways, or I read this in a number of different places talking about the importance of territorialization and like, maybe that's the wrong term, but, but, you know, being, being rooted in the land base that you're at, you're in, um, listening to it, trying to like understand what it teaches and how to live with it. Um, recognize how other people have done that and like rooting your struggle in a sense of place. And this is one of the reasons that some of these anti-colonial and anti-capitalist resistance movements in different places around the world look so different is because they're rooted in different legacies and practices, religions, languages, experiences of colonization. And I really appreciate the fact that you point this out and you say, like, look, it's not like, don't expect everything around the world to like circle their A's or to use the term autonomy necessarily for what they're doing, but just recognize similar traits among people that you can have solidarity with in the struggle against global capitalism and colonization. Can you talk a little bit about some of these similar traits, how you kind of identify these like versatile strategies? Yeah. So I, yeah, I think I do use the word territorialization or to territorialize, and that's that's largely coming from from Catalan and, and Spanish. In English, territorial tends to be an ugly word because it's associated with with possessiveness, with uh, drawing borders. Uh, I find it a very useful concept that's that's used here. So I just you know started using it in, in English. So I just encourage people to to look at the the roots of that word in in terra or tierra, like the the earth's like a relationship, the earth. You know, not, not as like this big abstract blue planet floating in the void, but the earth under our feet. So. It's interesting because you're asking about similarities. Uh, the, oh God, this is going to sound like some cliched bumper sticker or something like that. But my first response is to say that the similarity is is in the difference, because in like in an act of war against this world of supermarkets and and you know Amazon and like you know smartphone screens, which impose this uh, like secretly white supremacist homogeneity. When you territorialize, you are 
becoming part of a long historical tradition that is so, so, so specific to the exact place where you live and nowhere else. So that means eating different food, cooking it in a different way, pruning different trees. Uh, it, it means, you know, speaking, speaking uh, a different dialect of a different language. It, it means things that, that at first glance are maybe more defined or marked by their difference. But when you, when you see like gatherings of peasants from like different countries around the world or, or gatherings of, of gardeners, gatherings of revolutionaries who very much believe in being territorial in, in this sense that I'm trying to talk about it, who believe in having their roots in the ground beneath their feet and fighting from that relationship and understanding themselves within that relationship. One, one thing that strikes me is um, how much pleasure there is in, in sharing, like, you know, oh, this is how you do it. This is how we do it. Oh, this is what you eat. This is what we eat. And, and so that's, even though on the face of it, like, like the, the color of that, the texture of that seems to be bringing out differences. But I think that really like what's like the conversation that, that happens there. And it feels this way to me, like in, in so far as like, I mean, you know, like there's this, you know, alienated ex suburbanite who is like, you know, engaging in, in this, you know, like relatively later in my life, it, it to a limited extent has felt this way that like beneath the words, there's like the sort of language of love, which is, is completely a, an exercise in, in sameness, like not the sameness of homogeneity, but the sameness of we're living beings in this earth. And, and, you know, we love the earth that gives us our lives. We love the other living beings around us. And, and so really like, you know, people all across the world who are, who are, you know, living in autonomy and calling it different things and, and using very, very different technologies and eating very different foods and all the rest are on a deeper level doing the same thing. And, and I think can often wreck themselves in one another. I guess jumping back to a reference that you made a little bit ago, I was very moved by your chapter, A Very Different Future, where you were describing, in, in, in the primary part, of the first part of it at least, you were describing an alternative view of where we might be if we go down this path of sort of like a best case scenario of how reframing and, and healing the world could look. I feel like though there is a lot lot of doing needed to change the course that we as a species are on or that that we who live under the civilization are forced to live under the civilization live in one of the primary challenges that we face is one of imagination because the activities because imagination feeds the soul it's a playful creativity it's a necessary part of i of i think like what it is to be alive can you um speak about this uh, and sort of point to any projects or movements or people that you think listeners might appreciate in terms of having a radical imagination and being like brave enough to share that out with other people? Huh. Yeah, I'll start off underscoring how important I think imagination is. Uh, like you said, I think it's, um, I don't know, maybe I think it's more important than hope. Uh, sometimes it's just really not possible to access hope, but it's, it's nice even in those moments to be able to like look out your window or look out in the street and see, um, see a completely different world uh, filling up that space. Even if, you know, even if you don't think you'll ever live to see it. So that I think is, is extremely important. And, and I don't think that we can, I mean, obviously, you know, that like the, the world that we create is, is going to, is going to surprise us, you know, it'll, it'll be born in dialogue with us and it will also insist on, on certain things and impose itself in certain ways. Uh, But at the same time, I don't think we can create, um, create a society that we're unable to imagine, even though like the, the caveat that I just said was trying to, trying to communicate that it'll still be different from how we imagine it but but the imagining it is is a hugely important part of of creating it and i think it's extremely extremely important to make a very very clear analytical and strategic distinction between imaginings and blueprints uh creating blueprints is just a furtherance of of the war against the planet it is an extremely colonial act to impose a blueprint on the world and actually this uh reticence towards imagination is probably the biggest criticism I've ever had of insurrectionary anarchism, uh, like this general refusal to imagine, which isn't even really well supported 
by like you know the like the theoretical bases of of insurrection anarchism i think it just more often manifests as like a fear like an insistence of focusing on the present which has some you know important strategic elements to to that insistence like you know we're gonna focus on the present but then there's also i think this fear of of actually going beyond that who is doing a good job of sharing these these imaginings uh or these imaginations so, okay, so there's this one group that I interviewed in the U.S. Uh, for the book. Uh, I keep their location anonymous, uh, but basically they get funds and, and divert those, or they, they, uh, yeah, they take advantage of some financing that's intended for other purposes. Basically, it's intended to help large-scale industrial farmers uh, buy trees for windbreaks and whatnot. And this is a radical anti-capitalist group that uh, buys massive amounts of trees, like tens of thousands of trees in order to help neighborhoods move towards food autonomy. And I haven't seen them do anything that's like explicitly like propagandistic works of imagination. Like, you know, we can imagine like this, this area that we, that we live in, you know, being like, you know, an abundant orchard uh, where we can, you know, grow our own healthy food and not rely on wage labor to get low quality food. But I think on the material level, there's a great deal of imagination in what they do. And I think also it, a lot of it refers back to peasant and indigenous imagination from Latin America, because a lot of the neighborhoods where what they do is most effective are neighborhoods with, with a large number of, of uh, Central American migrants who have a lot of experience with growing their own food and with combining uh, residential and agricultural spaces in a way that is generally not done in the global north. And, and so if not on the level of like written propaganda, at the very least on the material level, there is a, a thriving imaginary in that project of neighborhoods, like poor neighborhoods, you know, working class neighborhoods that in, increase their, uh, their quality of life by growing healthy food. And that, like, I mean, this is one small group that's doing this. If this were done uh, across the U.S., then... You would, you would be creating like an atmospherically significant amount of, of carbon reduction, of carbon being uh, brought down from the air by reforestation that's done in a complex, healthy way and not in like a monocropping, genetically engineered way. And that also gives working class neighborhoods access to healthy food. Also, most of the trees that they're planting are um, autochthonous. How do we say that in English? Like they're, they're native. They're native species most of which have been neglected by industrial agriculture because industrial agriculture imposes a lot of needs that are divorced from the needs of human and environmental health, like transportability. Apples are great because, you know, they can be, they can be hard, they can be harvested early, and then they can be shipped around the world. Uh, pawpaws, for example, are a very, very important native uh, tree food uh, from North America. You know, they're kind of too mushy. They they don't work so well being transported, so they don't work so well as a supermarket food. And so that's a very healthy food, which is a part of indigenous cultures, indigenous histories, indigenous technology, which is is just removed from the equation by, you know, by by how it's done. And so it's it's really awesome to see a group that's that's bringing back a lot of those native species and increasing biodiversity and increasing human health in, in working class neighborhoods. Uh, aside from more material projects, there's something very, very important that anarchists have actually been doing for a long time uh, and that is experiencing a very, very exciting rebirth, which is anarchist speculative fiction, uh, whether science fiction or fantasy, there is uh, increasing attention being, uh, being paid to, uh, you know, some of the greats from the recent past, like Octavia Butler, you know, who's, who's um, a radical, you know, not, not an anarchist, but, you know, someone I've learned a lot from, someone, that, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter that, that she's not an anarchist. Uh, she's a really great writer and a really great thinker. So, yeah, uh, Octavia Butler, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. Over here, for example, they, they've even been republishing and re reprinting some of the, the anarchists who were engaging in like some speculative fiction from out, out of like the workers movement uh, in the late 19th century. And then you also have a lot of current writers who are, who are putting out anarchist speculative fiction. And that's something that we really need to support. And we need to try to, uh, to spread beyond just the movement, you know, get it into our libraries, get it into our local bookstores. Cause that that's generally more, more effective in you know spreading anarchist ideas and anarchist imaginaries than um, you know than a lot of our nonfiction writing. Yeah, 
Plus, it's fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've seen uh, warnings on social media and in some recently published books, such as uh, Climate Leviathan, which honestly I have not finished yet, just haven't had time, but of ideas of eco-Leninism or eco-Maoism or an ostensibly leftist authoritarian state response to climate destabilization, then I've got a feeling that it's not just about Derek Jensen anymore. Can you talk a little bit about this tendency and if you see this as an actual threat with actual adherence, like an uh, actual threat to liberty. Yeah, probably most significantly, Andreas Small took it in, into a new territory uh, well beyond, like, for example, like uh, Derek Jensen with that, that group. Um, and so this is something that is getting a, a lot of attention in anti-capitalist academic circles. I've never seen anywhere where it has any implantation on the ground. Uh, like directly in, you know, in real struggles or in in social movements. So from that perspective, it would seem just like, you know, like a very out of touch uh, elite making kind of, you know, wild arguments that are that are fairly ridiculous and, and irrelevant. Except I think we've seen dynamics before where when like the like the official centrist practices and ideologies flounder and are unable to produce solutions that the system needs in order to correct and survive. And that's definitely something, you know, we, we are entering that, that period of history right now where authoritarian elements in social movements that seem to be very, very tiny and not very relevant, all of a sudden grow really big, really fast. That happened in a huge way in the Spanish civil war where the authoritarian communists were completely irrelevant and tiny. And the, the, the anarchists had, um, so much influence in the revolutionary movement. And then in, in less than a year, because of outside funding and because of elite power structures making alliances of convenience, all of a sudden uh, authoritarian revolution, supposedly revolutionary methodology, because in fact, the Stalinists were, were quite explicit in, in saying that they weren't trying to fight the revolution in Spain, where those authoritarian currents gain ground really, really, really rapidly. And so we need to learn from history. We need to prepare ourselves for that eventuality or inevitability. And we need to be making the arguments now about how these authoritarian ways of looking at the problem are completely detached from people's needs and the needs of, of actual ecosystems uh, and how they are completely unrealistic given the nature of the problem. And so that also means being more um, vociferous about talking about our methodologies, our solutions, and the victories or partial victories that, that we have. In the case of Andreas Malm, he made it a little bit easy at the beginning with, with some pretty obviously racist anti-Indigenous uh, statements that, that, that he made. I mean, he's very much, he has trouble seeing past, you know, like the needs of like the reproduction of like global North white supremacist society. But I think later iterations of that kind of authoritarian eco leninist thinking are going to be more sophisticated and they're going to do a better job at hiding their colonial and, and white supremacist dynamics. And so I think we need to, yeah, we need to be conscious uh, of, of that danger while it's still small. Does it seem strange to you that AK Press just um, published a book by him last year? Um, How to Blow Up a Pipeline? I didn't, I don't. Oh, how do we blow up a pipeline? Um, I mean, there, yeah, there's there are anarchist publishers that, you know, take take the approach of only only publishing books that they have uh, that they feel affinity with, and I think some really really important uh, literature that you know is is not commercially viable has has gotten circulated that way, and that's really important. And then there are other there are other radical publishers like AK that, that take the approach of being a very broad platform. And there are some, there are some things that AK publishes that I wouldn't have found out about or gotten access to that both have like a broader appeal or like a less radical appeal. And that are also, I think like exactly the things that anarchists, especially in North America need to be thinking about uh, that like a, address things that like, you know, we historically ignore and do a, a terrible job of. And then there are things that, that, you know, AK or similar publishers have published that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole or that I, you know, would touch like to burn maybe. 
Yeah, and I'm not mean to put like AK Press on the spot specifically, but like no, yeah, you know, sure. that book, like, and then like I'm Nick Estes. Like, the, the same thing applies, you know, to other like you know, like you know, PM, like all sure. all of these like larger platform publishers. I think like I as a person would tend more just because of I don't know, like my personality or whatever. I don't know, would like tend more to like the sort of like small like affinity kind of um, oriented model. But I'm also able to recognize that, like, the way, like, a broader publisher does things has advantages and it puts us in contact with texts and ideas that, that we really need to be in dialogue with. And that if we're just focusing on affinity, like, we'll never get out of our little um, little echo chamber. So, yeah, and then I'll, like, uh, if some of, some of the, the Marxists who I respect, who are more, who are closer to anarchism, say that Andreas Malm's... Um, earlier like big seminal book was like important and uh and useful like like about like uh like about like you know climate capitalism about like looking at like you know the like intersections between between climate change and and like capitalism's earlier development so you know evidently like he's put out things that are that are theoretically useful but i but i think he's kind of a clown um when it comes to direct action like he's coming from like this highly privileged, uh, you know, Scandinavian social dem- democratic vantage point where he can talk about the, you know, his flirtation with direct action from a few years ago, you know, without the risk of going to prison, which is <laughs> like, like, that's just, uh, you know, that's another planet for the rest of us. And, and then he like, you know, with like how to blow up a pipeline, it's just, I don't know, it just seems so like vapid and fatuous, like this, you know, highly privileged academic talking really tough about, yeah, we're going to, you know, take this thing down when he really has no idea what he's talking about. And he tends to talk about it in very irresponsible and unrealistic ways. Hmm. Available at a bookstore near you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of my favorite answers to the question of, you know, how can listeners offer solidarity from where they're at that I've, you know, asked guests in the past. One of the best answers that I've gotten consistently you know, with from people that are doing anti mega project work or blocking pipelines, a mega project, I guess, uh, anti colonial struggles, is to do that work where we're at against the oppressive dynamics here to destabilize the capitalist core so that autonomy can flourish here as well as at the peripheries. Um, and I feel like that was really echoed in the conclusion of your book. What would you tell people the, you know, a good next step is after reading the book? Um, Leading question. Yeah. In, I mean, in tandem with developing a global perspective that's, that's real, that's based in actual relationships of solidarity with, um, with people and with struggles in other parts of the world, uh, I would say that taking steps, at least baby steps towards food autonomy, uh, is something that can be done anywhere and needs to be done anywhere. And that it's also an interesting exercise or an interesting line of attack because it can kind of give us new perspectives on, you know, what, what are the structures that get in the way of our survival? You know, what are the structures that really need to be identified as enemies and sharing food is, is a really powerful activity on every level. And so moving beyond more superficial practices of affinity towards practices of, of solidarity with people who are, you know, like don't think the same way as us, you know, as, as a step towards actually creating like a community worthy of the name, food is extremely important. Being able to share food, being able to decrease, you know, dependence on, on capitalism in that aspect. That's, that's uh, you know, if I had to give a shorter answer, I would, I would um, highlight that for, for special attention. So start a garden. You heard it here first. <laughs> oh no, 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 housing housing is really important totally. uh, taking over a housing block uh, anyways yeah there's <laughs> it's uh to answer properly you have to talk about so many different things i guess intervene where you can and and have some imagination i really like the fact that a couple times in the book that you challenged the the readership to like no really stop reading take it please take a moment close your eyes or look out the window and just do some thinking yeah that's good Peter, are you working on anything else now, right now, or just kind of like um, taking care of business between between books? Uh, right now, just trying to stay alive, and um, yeah, looking at. Um, I think we're doing a very bad job generally in our movements of of taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other, and so I'm trying to look at that more. Um, uh, yeah, trying to 
get off my ass to actually plant my garden <laughs> this spring. And uh, yeah, we're we're still working on the infrastructures gatherings, the anarchist infrastructures gatherings here in Catalonia. When yeah, whenever I find the motivation to to start working on the next book, the next one will probably be a critique of democracy, both representative and direct. And then I'd also love to get to this like research project about yeah the invention of whiteness in the in the Spanish colonial experience, since it's been mostly studied in like you know the the English experience of the invention of, of whiteness through through colonialism cool well um thanks for this lovely book uh, i really enjoyed the read and thank you for taking the time to talk thank you thank you for taking the time to talk and thanks for thanks for reading thanks for uh the conversation and yeah thanks for being in touch of course and now some words from anarchist prisoner sean swain the following is a continuation of Sean Swain's tradition of reading the names of people killed by cops in the so-called USA, based on data from fatalencounters.org. June 1st, 2021. Robert Pierce, Berwick, Louisiana. Donald Wayne, Catfish Myers, Ray City, Georgia. Jonathan Craig Thomas, Independence, Kentucky. Name withheld by police, Sierra Blanca, Texas. Christopher Dias, Sumrall, Mississippi. June 2nd, 2021. Bernard Bobby Darnell Godwin, Williamton, Denver. Clayton Wayne Barbie, Cartwick, Oklahoma. David J. Birdwick, Merrill, Wisconsin. Eugene Matthews, Arvada, Colorado. James Andrew Dringenberg, Whittier, California. Timothy Drew Andrew Kemp Jr., Hot Springs, Arkansas. June 3rd, 2021. Robert Welch, Chandler, Arizona. Thomas Buck Brian Buchanan, Temple, Georgia. Winston Boogie Smith Jr., Minneapolis, Minnesota. William Brookin Sr., Phoenix, Arizona. June 4th, 2021. Andrew Homan, Braintree, Maine. Jerry Wayne Henley, Hillham, Tennessee. Lloyd C. Smalls, Walterboro, South Carolina. Name withheld by police, Whittier, California. Colton Frederick Wagner, Denver, Colorado. Patsy S. Arnold, Lee Summit, Montana. Raymond Edwards III, Tucson, Arizona. Sander Daniels, San Diego, California. Timothy Flowers, Rochester, New York. June 5th, 2021. Jermaine Leonard Mari, Brookhaven, Georgia. Jose Angel Ibarra Ruiz, Meadville, Texas. Kyle E. Shorette, Burga, North Carolina. Mark A. Sousa, Mount Vernon, Maine. Wong Tay. Green Forest, Arkansas. Michael J. Knighton, Denham Springs, Louisiana. Stephen Neal Wiegand, Griffin, Georgia. Name withheld by police, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Udoa Maka Nuwamu, Douglasville, Georgia. William Wickwert, Afton, Oklahoma. June 7th, 2021. Antonio Diaz, Round Rock, Texas. Clayton Shannon Willingham, Jefferson City, Montana. Crystal Renee Gurr, Garden City, Montana. Daniel Jacob Ojeda, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Jeremiah Lee Wright, Happy Valley, Oregon. Keith Jackson, Riverview, Florida. Lee Wiskiewicz, Bayonne, New Jersey. Name withheld by police, Homestead Base, Florida. Lazavier Shamar Cook, Tallulah Falls, Georgia. Clint Christopher Morris, Nisus, South Carolina. June 8th, 2021. Jason A. Mitchell, St. John, Indiana. Gary Anthony Creek, Sandy Springs, Georgia. Kevin Christopher Caldwell, Columbus, Georgia. Louis Nathan Leba, Española, New Mexico. June 9th, 2021. 
Ashley Marie Forward, Salgas, Massachusetts. Juan de la Cruz Rodriguez, Yucca Valley, California. Michael Lee Ross Jr., Forest Hill, Texas. Terrell T.J. Gass, College Park, Georgia. Sandra Baez, Woodland, New Jersey. Gregory E. Hambrick, Jasper, Alabama. John Anthony Little, Biloxi, Missouri. Josiah L. Bayard, Wilcox, Arizona. Name was held by police, Fulshear, Texas. Nigel Phillips, Omaha, Nebraska. Rezek Yakub Yahya, Salt Lake City, Utah. Thomas Rossi, Eagleville, Pennsylvania. June 11th, 2021. Name withheld by police, Baltimore, Maryland. William Michael Cradlack, Jr., Watsontown, Pennsylvania. June 12th, 2021. Chris Moore, Dorsey, Mississippi. Christopher M. Van Cleek, Middletown, New York. Kenneth Earl Mackey, Barstow, California. Dwayne D.J. Monsonares, Jr., Denver, Colorado. Eric Eugene Cole, Jr., Springfield, Ohio. Jose Joe Ruiz III, Bakersfield, California. Luis Ray Ruiz, Ackworth, Georgia. Ryan Yakiharu Santos, Hilo, Hawaii. Stephen Chili Tyler Griffith, Stephen City, Virginia. June 14th, 2021. Adam Michael Green, Hermitage, Tennessee. Anthony Hannon, Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Armanda Contreras, Birmingham, Alabama. Evan Kimberly Payne, Iva, South Carolina. Kevin Richard Giselle, Parma, Ohio. Lakita Willis, Decatur, Georgia. Manuel Rojas Barrejas, Calexico, California. Name withheld by police. Tamarack, Florida. DeMonta Lamar Hambright, Jr., Milwaukee, Wisconsin. June 15th, 2021. DeMonta Lamar Hambright, Jr., Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jason Scott D'Ambrosio, Honey Grove, Texas. Jimmy J. Wynn, Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Juan Miguel Bejar, Paris, California. Nathan Nate Damian Rabe, Westmoreland, Tennessee. Perry E. Boyd, Wolcott, Indiana. Solomon Jameson, Jackson, Mississippi. Ansi Jimmy Loy Lawrence Dulce, Holly Springs, Georgia. Billy Jack Barker, Bessemer City, North Carolina. Christopher Chris Sherrod Butler, Lawrence, South Carolina. David Aaron King, Harrison, Arkansas. Jermaine Saunier, Houston, Texas. John Earl Barnes, Alford, Florida. Kendall Allen Jamerson, Vesuvius, Virginia. Michael D. Mason, Lexington, Kentucky. Name withheld by police. Leonia, New Jersey. Name withheld by police. Whitsett, North Carolina. Odine K. Cummings, Beaverton, Oregon. Sean Michael Roy Montonia, Beaverton, Oregon. Stephen Emery Milton, Savannah, Georgia. Tony Robert Hall, Jr., Harrison, Ohio. Zachary Minasel, Eureka, Nevada. June 17th, 2021, Daniel Ray, Covington, Kentucky. John Geisler, Moon Township, Pennsylvania. Max Jaramillo, Vegeta, New Mexico. Max Jaramillo, Vegeta, New Mexico. Michael J. Brooks, Jr., Leesport, Pennsylvania. Name withheld by police, Leesport, Pennsylvania. Caitlin Joe, Katie Robinson, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Thomas B. Maroney, Marysville, Washington. June 18th, 2021, Carlos Jackson, Lithia Springs, Georgia. Daniel Buckingham, Hilo, California. 
Eric Scott Anderson, Encitas, California, Everett Stern, Atlantic City, New Jersey, June 19th, 2021, Gregory Hoskins, Gary, Indiana, Jeff Melvin, Salem, Alabama, Tyler Hodge, Wichita, Kansas, Brianna Sykes, Flint, Michigan, June 20th, 2021, Rita Joan Lillard, Houston, Texas, Dario Dominguez, Kansas City, Kansas, James Bubba Everett Taylor Jr., Millbrook, Alabama, Mickey Ray Rice, Robbinsville, North Carolina, June 21st, 2021, John Johnny Hurley, Arvada, Colorado, Carter Singh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Virgil Lee Taylor, Hamilton, Michigan, June 22nd, 2021, Alexander Matthew Collins, Covington, Georgia, David Harold Grant Morgan, Riverside, Alabama, Deshaun J. Hill, Luray, Virginia, Michael Wolski, New Berlin, Wisconsin, Noah D. Sharp, DeSoto, Montana, Willie T. Salazar, Murray, Utah, June 23rd, 2021, Daryl J. Gacken, Lamar, Pennsylvania, Earl Fitzgerald Hunter, Fountain Inn, South Carolina. Francisco Javar Lino Guterres, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Fred Holder, Norwalk, California. Gary Lee Deering, Greenfield, Missouri. Isaiah Green, Lubbock, Texas. Michael Lee Gerhardt, Surprise, Arizona. Name withheld by police, Fontana, California. Name withheld by police, Eagle Pass, Texas. Nathan Roy Ball, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Noah Hunter Britton, Cabot, Arkansas. Robert Allen Blackburn, Corinth, Mississippi. June 24th, 2021. Abraham Torres Mesa, Bakersfield, California. Chad Necessary, Washington, North Carolina. David Ronald Bridget, Iron River, Michigan. Michael Ray Townsend, Portland, Oregon. Name withheld by police, Little River, South Carolina. Stephen J.D. Jesse Dillon Thompson, Auburn, Georgia. Ted Frank Tippy, Monroe, Georgia. William Dean Hewitt, Whiteville, North Carolina. Yonatan Aguilera, Cumming, Georgia. June 25th, 2021. Albert Wayne Finney Jr., College Station, Texas. David Leon Van Lander, Wyoming. Dennis Edward Delgado, Kansas City, Kansas. Dimitri Lanahan, Fairbanks, Arkansas. Deonta O. Moore, Venice, Illinois. Dwayne Michael Fields, Fife, Washington. Michael Anthony Frederick, McDonald, Tennessee. Michael DeAnthony Andrews, Canyon, Texas. Reginald Ray Hansen, Grand Junction, Colorado. Travis Parham Jr., Memphis, Tennessee. Wallace Wallow Lee Morris, Memphis, Tennessee. Dasan DJ Jones, Curtis Bay, Maryland. June 26, 2021. Aida Vicencio, Los Angeles, California. Antoine Brooks, Huntingtown, Maryland. Don Allen Croson, Texarkana, Arkansas. Nathan Allen, Winthrop, Massachusetts. Roberto Acosta Reyes, Abilene, Texas. June 27th, 2021. Jerome Barber, Azusa, California. Marcus Mark Gatis, Lorries, South Carolina. Megan Stamper, Independence, Missouri. Nicole DeChant, Plainville, Kansas. Oscar Nahara III, Roswell, New Mexico. Stephen Wayne Winder, Graham, Texas. June 28, 2021, Jehon Bamboom, Willimpton, North Carolina. Jose Mario Feles, Santa Maria, California. Jose Manuel Quema, Antonio Delgado, Warrington, Virginia. June 28, 2021, Justin D. Murray, Avon, Indiana. 
Name withheld by police. Arleta, California. Name withheld by police. Hemet, California. Robert Allier, Commerce City, Colorado. Robert George Keitlinger, Grant, Alabama. Sue Bleach, Kuab, Hodge, Weed, California. Tristan Trevino, Corpus Christi, Texas. June 29th, 2021. Larry Lee Hunt, Bayard, Nebraska. Philip Sanders, Corpus Christi, Texas. June 30th, 2021. John Hayden Ina Bennett III, St. Matthew, South Carolina. Joseph Lee Humbles, Atlanta, Georgia. Name withheld by police, South Ogden, Utah. Jeremy Andrew Nelson, Florence, Kentucky. Emmett Weaver, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org Psst. You can cash app dollar sign swainiac 1969 or send dota us and comment that it's for swain's defense more info is also available on instagram at at swainiac 1969 or twitter at at swain rocks this is the final straw the show will later be archived at the final straw radio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at the final straw radio at riseup.net or the final straw radio at protonmail.com if you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.